It's good to uh, come around the word of the Lord. And um, you forgive me, I've got a bit of a sore throat still hang hanging over. So if I'm a little bit, a bit of a frog in my throat, please pray for me. Hope to make it to the end of the sermon. It's just uh, uh, preaching yesterday in Stockport, um, and it was probably not a great idea. Didn't find that out until I started, just kind of hitting that next level of preaching. Um, but just a bit of a sore throat. Um, but we're going to carry on this morning with the parables of Jesus. And this morning we're going to look at what is quite, um, I suppose you'd call it a controversial parable. And that is um, the, the parable of the unforgiving servant. So we're just going to go straight to the text, uh, which is in Matthew 18. If you have a Bible with you, you want to follow me? Matthew 18. And it starts in verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and he delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. Okay, we'll stop there. So, two things we need to do with this parable, I think, to understand it. Firstly, we need to understand it in its context. And secondly, we need to apply it uh, to ourselves, to our lives. There's no point just kind of going through these parables and going, oh yeah, I understand what he's saying, but then not actually applying it to your own life. You just end up with a head full of stories that Jesus told. You know, there, there are practical applications for all these parables. There's something that God wants you to do with them. Otherwise, he wouldn't be, you know, Jesus wouldn't be, be telling them. So first of all, uh, the, the context comes uh, in verse 21 and verse 22. And I'll just put it up here for you. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord... How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So that's a really specific question, isn't it? If my brother sins against me, how, how many times should that be that I forgive him? Uh, till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Some of you might even do the maths now. Um, why, why is Peter saying that? Well, the, the, the teaching at the time, the, the, the Pharisaical teaching was that you should forgive your brother three times. Okay? And so you can see what's happening here, I think, is Peter. Peter's starting to get an understanding that, yeah, the way Jesus teaches, it always requires something deeper, doesn't it? It's always that bit further than what the Pharisees have been teaching. So, like, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard it said. Uh, Thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you, 
you're angry you know, with your brother and your heart. You heard it said, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, you lust after a woman in your heart. And so maybe Peter's kind of got this idea and he's thought, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to say three times because that's what the Pharisees teach. I'll double it and I'll add one. And I'm, I'm, you know, I must be getting near then. Is it seven times, Lord? And, and what Jesus does, the answer he gives, he's not actually thinking of a specific number. If you're trying to work that out. The, the, these are symbolic uh, numbers that the Bible quite often uses. You know, s seven is the number of perfection. So what Jesus is saying is he, he, he's taking... He's taking Peter's suggestion, how about seven times? And he's just blowing that up as a right through the roof. He's just blowing Peter's mind, saying, no, not seven times. In other words, an innumerable amount of times. Just just, you know, just keep forgiving. There is not a set number, Peter, that I can put upon. You know, how many times should I forgive my brother? And there's a kind of legalistic mindset there, isn't it? You know, so tell me specifically what, no, it's a matter of a heart. You're supposed to love uh, uh, your brother. And, and that is really important to understanding the whole of this parable. What's it about? Well, the context is that Peter's talking about forgiving his brother. And, and, and Jesus is saying, look, the times you forgive him, it's an innumerable amount. That you, you're not going to set a particular figure on that. Okay, so that being said, we're going to just... Quickly look at the, the we've got to be kind of like a bit like detectives this morning. We're going to, I'm going to lay out some evidence before you, and then we're just going to go through through the evidence. What, you know, well, what what is the what are the characters in this parable? What what are the objects in this parable? Uh, how do they you know what's the most obvious meaning here? And then we're going to look about applying it to our to ourselves and our, and our Christian lives. Uh, so so first of all, we we get. Uh, a certain king. You know, that phrase in verse 23, there's a certain king. There's also uh, a servant in verse 24. And then there's this, this, this object around which the whole, the whole controversy uh, rotates, if you like, and that's this debt, a debt that is owed. Uh, and then we have another servant, uh, a fellow servant, and do you remember he also has a debt, uh, but, but we're not told uh, the amount of, the, of that debt. And then, uh, right at the end of the parable, there was this rather strange phrase, uh, the tormentors, that he will ha hand them over to the tormentors in verse uh, 34. It, it, it's our job now to try and decipher uh, what is being said here and to understand, well, well, what is God saying? Well, we start off with a certain king, didn't we? A certain king. And throughout the Bible, there's lots of... Uh, there's lots of teaching and historical evidence of various kings. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, in the New Testament there's King Agrippa, there's King Herod. But, but in the context of this parable, uh, I think the, the, the verse that most closely resembles it is found in Matthew 22 and verse 2. You see here in this parable it says a certain king. And in Matthew 22, verse 2, it says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. Exactly the same phrase, isn't it? And it's written by exactly the same writer, same gospel writer, Matthew, as a certain king, uh, which made a marriage for his son. And when you read it, when you read Matthew uh, 22, it's clear that the king uh, that it's talking about is God, or specifically God the Father, and that the Son is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, so I think it's reasonable to, to, to start with, well, who is this certain king? A certain king, that the, the, the certain king represents God. Uh, and and so through the Old Testament, Daniel 4.37, uh, God is described as the King of Heaven. Uh, Psalm 47, we sang, we sang some words from this morning, Psalm 47 and verse 2. Uh, God is described as the king over all uh, the earth. So, so the king, in this case, in the parable of the unforgiving servant, the king is God himself. And Jesus Christ, uh, of course, is the son of God. It says right at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So is it too much to assume then that the king in our parable represents God. I don't think it is. 
And this king has a servant, his name. He has a servant. And, and through, again, throughout the Bible, that term servant is used of those who serve, follow God. Uh, the servant of the Lord, 2 Timothy 2, 24, servants to God, uh, who we're told have fruit unto holiness, Romans 6, 22. Uh, Matthew 24, 45 talks about a faithful and wise servant. And then again, Matthew 24, 48 talks about an evil servant. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because you've got servants of God, they're serving him, they're doing his will. But then there seems to be this kind of, this sense of, of, of free will. That somebody who is serving God can actually turn away and decide not to serve God. And then become, become an evil servant. Um, so so, so that in theological terms, doctrinal terms, that's interesting. That there's free will. There's free will involved in serving God. And then there's this the really interesting, isn't it? This debt. And it says that the debt owed is ten thousand talents. And again, you know, the different modern translations, some trans what one translated it as something like fifty million silver coins. That I can't picture that, you know, I don't really find that helpful. Uh, to, to, so, so what, what is 10,000 talents? Well, it's an awful lot of money. Uh, uh, that's the point of the parable. It's a tremendous amount of money that the servant owes his king. And his king says, I want this back now. And, uh, and he asks for mercy. But, but you see, that, that figure, 10,000 talents, just like Peter's uh, question, Jesus answered 70 times so, it's not... Uh, it's not a specific number. I believe in this case, this is not a specific number. It's not telling you how much the debt was. It's, it's figurative because the Greek word that's used for that 10,000 talents is, uh, is myriad. And, and myriad, where we get our English word, myriads. You say, oh, there's myriads and myriads of people at the football match. I'm that, but, but that's what it means. You know, it's an innumerable amount, too much to count. And so this, the, the, this, what, this 10,000 talents means there's a, there's a number, this debt is so great that the man has no hope of ever being able to pay it back. And of course that's what, you know, he, he's just begging for mercy. Uh, and so the, the king is moved with compassion. Well then we see that what happens is that, that, that alright, he's been forgiven this debt. It's been, it's been written off if you like. But then he sees a fellow servant. And, and the fellow servant owes him money. But instead of thinking, hang on, look at what I've just been forgiven. Look at the compassion that's been shown to me. Perhaps now I should be extending that to others. He now, all, all you think of is, well, this person owes me some money. And so he's really unkind and rough with him, isn't he? And, and, and in fact, throws him into prison to pay off uh, uh, this debt, and so, so the, the, this, this fellow servant again is important to understand. Um, the, the, the fellow servant is a, is a co-slave; he's a servant of the same master. Okay, so start to apply that now to our own lives as Christians. Okay, so the king represents God; the servant represents someone who serves God. Well, I serve God. Yeah? Uh, there are fellow servants who are also serving the same king. Well, that's my brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't it? That we both serve the same king. And I know that God has forgiven me much. We were singing about this morning, weren't we? Amazing grace. Well, God has forgiven me. And he's forgiven me what? An innumerable debt. I can't pay back God for my sins. I can't say, well, look, God, how about if I, you know, Help, help an old lady across the road or give some money to charity. That's not going to wipe out my sins. The only hope I've got is that God will forgive my sins and remove that debt. And of course, that is exactly what this parable is saying, is that the debt is forgiven, that the king removes that, 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 that debt. He, he, 
He allows uh, the servant to go free. When he had every right, he could have said, no, you owe me that money. You know, I, I, I'm going to, I want that back. I want some kind of uh, punishment for the money that you owe me. But he didn't. Uh, you know, and we can apply this to ourselves. You know, the price of your sin, 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, you were bought with a price. Redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1 verse 7. So the, 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 the blood of Christ has paid that, hasn't it? Uh, but, but what happens now is instead of remembering that, instead of fixing that in his, in his mind, the servant now uh, gets all self-righteous towards his fellow servant and, uh, and he wants the money back. And, and so his master, the king, then calls him, verse 32, thou wicked servant. Yeah, you wicked servant. And therefore, what does he do? He casts him into prison. Uh, to, to, he gives him to the tormentors. That was the phrase, wasn't it? That it used. So I'm going to think about this now. Think about what's happening. What's happening in this, 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 this parable? Is it really, is it talking um, about sin? Is, that what it's about? is it about Christians? Is it about sin? Have a look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Remember, we're looking for... We're, I'm not trying to push any kind of agenda here or, or think, right, I'm going to start with this, this particular doctrine and I'm going to stick it like, you know, like in... What's that pantomime? Cinderella. Where they try and... Where the ugly sisters try and... Squeeze their big ugly feet into that glass slipper. I'm not going to take my horrible ugly doctrine and squeeze it into this passage. We're just looking at well, what's it mean? What's the most obvious meaning that it's saying? So Matthew 6, verse 12, it says, uh, and this is the Lord's Prayer, right? And we come down to verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now you might know that as forgive us our sins or forgive us our trespasses. But here it has, forgive us our debts. So it's clear that the, the idea of debt, sin, and, and trespass is the same concept, doesn't it? You know, I was saying, you know, God forgive us uh, our debts, our sins, as we forgive our, our debtors. And if you come down to verse 15 of that chapter, here's a really interesting verse. It says, but if you forgive not men, their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of making the picture a little clearer, isn't it? It's, it, it's, a, it's a little uncomfortable now when you think about that. Um, but is it possible? Is it possible that God, who's forgiven us, could, could, could then turn around and say, well, no, I'm sorry, um, that, that debt that I said was forgiven, I'm now reinstating that debt because of the way in which you have treated your fellow servant. I think there's a problem with how Christians think about grace, you know, just as a general thing, that, that some people are like, well, you know, you, you're, you're all about holiness, you guys, and you're about, you know, walking in obedience to Christ. But I'm about grace. I want us grace, guys. You know, to me, it's all about grace. And, and it's like, it's almost like they're dividing their heads, you know, Christianity into two groups. Those who are about grace, and those who are about obeying Christ. And you can't do that. Because, because you see, it's only because of the grace of God that I am able to walk in obedience to Christ. You know, grace uh, uh, has given all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, you, you, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But what grace is not, it's not an excuse for you to carry on sinning. It's not a, like a kind of, well, I've, I've got the ticket to heaven now because of grace. So I'm just going to carry on, you know, leave, just leading my old sinful life because I've got grace. Because I've got 
You know, Jude warns us, doesn't he, that some turn grace into lasciviousness. They turn it into an excuse for their sin. I'm all right because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. But there's nowhere in the scriptures that it says, look, now you don't have to obey Christ. Now you don't have to walk in true holiness. It's a, it's, it's a misconcept. You know, in fact, throughout the Bible, there are lessons. You know, don't assume that because you've got privileges that you don't have to look at how you live. You don't have to look at how you behave towards other people. Um, way back in Genesis even, Genesis 49, when, uh, do you remember when Jacob comes into the land of Egypt, you know, Joseph is uh, uh, the governor there, and calls for his father and his brethren to come and, and, and live in Egypt, and he calls us, really, in Genesis 49, um, Jacob speaks to his sons, he blesses his sons, he says like a little thing about each one, and uh, Reuben is the eldest son, he's the firstborn, and by rights, what happens is the firstborn receives the biggest blessing, right? He, he, he receives, uh, his father passes on to him all the things that were his father's. That's his right. But in, in Genesis 49, what happens is Jacob says to Reuben, you are unstable as water. That's a great phrase, isn't it? So you're unstable as water. You're like all over the place. You know, and, and he cites a sin that Reuben committed. I think it's something like 40 years ago. Uh, but Jacob says, because of this, because of your character, I'm not going to give you the blessing that is by rights yours. I'm going to give it to your brother Judah. And that's what he does. And that's why Christ himself, Messiah then, comes out of the tribe of Judah. Because Judah was given the prominent position. When they go into battle, it's Judah that's the tribe that's leading, not Reuben. Because of how Reuben had behaved. See, grace is not just, it's not just a question of grace to you. It's also a question of grace from you. Yeah? To other people. And, you know, Peter talks about this. He says that as a Christian, you and I, you know, we should be adding to our character certain attributes we should add brotherly kindness <coughs> and to brotherly kindness <coughs> love and he says Christians that don't do that they're blind and they have forgotten that they've been purged or cleansed from their own sins you've forgotten it you've forgotten Ephesians 4 32 be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So to remind ourselves in our interaction with other Christians, with other brethren, hang on, I don't, I don't own this forgiveness that God has shown to me. It was shown to me by grace. And therefore... If I've been forgiven this enormous debt that I could never hope to pay back, if I've been forgiven this sin, then shouldn't I be forgiving other people their sins against me? And you can, you know, you can talk all you want about the quote unconditional love of God, but you'll be standing against the scriptures. Because all the time, if, if, if. If you do not forgive, what was it? If you forgive not men their trespasses. If sounds like a condition to me. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Always best to get your doctrine from the Bible. Not from popular words, phrases, teachings, memes, God forbid. Get it from the Bible. Go to the scriptures, yeah? Don't just say, yeah, I love that phrase. I love what they're saying. That sounds so great. You know, I'm not interested in, in, in preaching stuff that makes people feel good. Or for that matter, preaching stuff that makes people feel bad. I'm interested in what is the truth? What does the Bible teach? You know, that's what I want to know. And, and if it makes me feel wonderful and all fuzzy inside, 
praise God. And if it challenges me, praise God again. Because it's the truth. And that's what that is what is, is valuable. So in this parable, we have a wicked, unforgiving, violent, selfish servant. And his debt is restored in full. In fact, he's told that he will remain with the, quote, tormentors, or the jailers, is what it means. You'll remain with them until you have paid it back in full. Till you have paid back your sin in full. Till you have paid back that innumerable amount in full. Well, that's going to take forever. And that's the teaching. That's the doctrine. Yeah. It will take an eternity, won't it? Till he should pay back all that was due to him. Is it really about that? Is it really about Christians forgiving uh, one another? And if not, as a penalty for that? Yes, it is. Because right at the end of that parable, Matthew 18, 35, it says, And so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That's the key to understanding the whole parable of what it's saying. So when I get saved, when I become a Christian, can I say, yeah, I got my ticket to heaven, I'm alright. Don't have to worry about it. You know, I'm all about grace. I'm all about grace. So I can just, you know, carry on sinning and, and I don't have to treat other people like decent human beings because I'm all about grace. That's not grace. <laughs> That's not the grace of the Bible. Not the grace that God showed to you. God is not mocked, the scripture says. Dare we say that God cannot restore the debt that he cancelled. Don't we put that on God and say, God, you can't do this. You can't restore that debt because it's gone now. You have got the authority, God. Can we dare we say that to God? Dare we cling to anything but grace? God's grace. I can't say, well, I wrote it in my Bible. God forgave me on this day. Yeah. That's not trusting the grace of God, is it? That's trusting in something that happened in your life on a particular date. We're told to live by faith. That's not living by faith. It's day by day I walk with God. Dare we hold against our brethren so little. These little things that happen. These little disagreements, fallouts. They didn't speak to me. Uh, they didn't acknowledge me this morning. Uh, they disagreed with me about something in the Bible. You know, and then we, we, we flounce off. Why won't we go there again? You know, dare we really hold against our brethren so little when God has forgiven us so much? Dare we make a light of the fact that God gave his son for us, shed his blood for us? There's a warning in this parable about how we behave, that the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, to take away our debt, our sin, must now be shown by us, the same grace to other people, to other Christians. Now, if something happens in a church, if there's abuse, if there is, uh, uh, if there is behavior that is unscriptural, unchristian, unbiblical, then there are means to deal with that. There are, there, there are disciplinary, uh, measures in Matthew 18 that explains to you how that is to be dealt with. But let us be forgiving one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the way in which uh, these words make us think soberly, Lord, about uh, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Christ. Now, Lord, much harm has been
been done by believers who who became hard-hearted, who wouldn't forgive. Lord, help us to mature. Help us to be uh, to grow into the stature of Christ Himself, Lord. To be more and more like Him. To take Him as our example, Lord, and and to add to our character those attributes of brotherly kindness and love, Lord, that we might grow into. Uh, a temple of praise to you like living stones built up into the house of God Lord, that is our desire I pray Lord that you would indeed give grace for us that that might happen that you might empower us with your Holy Spirit that we might overcome our infirmities and, uh, and our weaknesses and that we therefore might be uh, pleasing in your son. In Jesus' name.